Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, I am your host for these here shenanigans. Uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit of a review roundup, something that we don't do very often, but uh, it's a good chance to, to catch up and discuss a few new films uh, that I am interested in, and I hope you are too. Uh, this will probably be relatively short uh, as these episodes go. Um, as many of you know, uh, if you've been listening to this show, I've been on a journey to become a public school teacher uh, in a fit of madness, and I have done so. I now am officially a public school teacher. I teach freshman English, and uh, boy, that is a mess. Uh, so it also means that, especially in the early goings, um, it's just very, very busy. I don't have a whole lot of free time to devote to the podcast stuff, and so getting an episode out a week is is kind of tough. Uh, but I am doing my level best to make that happen. And in the process of making that happen, um, you know, sometimes we do episodes like this that aren't necessarily the longest, but are a, an opportunity to, to catch up and, and do some stuff uh, that I'm interested in. So enough apologies, uh, enough of the so Socratic apologia um, for uh, this being a shorter episode. Uh, but uh, I, I the, these are three movies that I do want to talk about. So... Movie number one is the the movie sensation, the horror sensation, sweeping the world, uh, Skinamarink, which uh, was getting a lot of buzz uh, when it was online. Um, you know, I think it had leaked online at some point, and then it made its way into theaters, and then Shudder picked it up. So, like, it is, boy, has this movie been making the rounds. And it's one of those movies that comes along every so often where somebody's like, this is the scariest movie of the year. This may be one of the scariest movies ever made. Um, do I think that is true? Mm, probably not. Uh, I think it's it's certainly one of the most interesting horror movies I've seen in a while. And it, it sort of begs the question, why this one, though? And I think I have an answer to that. Uh, you, you know, again, in the Socratic method, let us question our way to the answer. Uh, I do think that this movie is unusual and it's well made. Uh, my biggest knock against the movie is that at an hour 40, it feels a little long. Um, you know, it's tough to say with something like this that is almost more of this like surreal art installation than it is a movie. It's hard to say, like, well, what, what would I take out? What are the shots that we can excise from this movie and still have the same effect? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that would require more viewings. And, and I, I, this is a movie I will absolutely watch again, uh, probably under different circumstances, though. Because when I first watched it, I was watching it with my partner. And I told her, like, hey, I really want to uh, check this movie out. Like, I've heard a lot about it. And so as I'm watching it, like, she's not paying attention. She couldn't care less about some experimental horror movie. Um, especially one that is largely comprised of static images and barely discernible audio. Uh, and, and so she's having no part of this. And occasionally one of the kids would come in and I would have to pause it. And I also don't think that is the best way to see this movie. Um, you know, I think that you're best served kind of experiencing this all at once instead of like, oh my God, I got to go check a bedroom to make sure it's clean and then come back and watch Skinamarink, uh, some more. Um, so all that being said, like I, am basically laying the groundwork for me saying, I don't know that I went crazy for it the way that some people did, but I did really like it. And I think a lot of times people will re refer to a movie as Lynchian when it is not necessarily Lynchian at all. Um, this is one of the few movies that feels like some like Twin, Pe Twin Peaks Season 3 kind of business. And I really liked it for that. Um, it does feel like an art film. Uh, and not just like, oh, well, A24 does art films. Like, Midsummer is an art film. Like, no, 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 fuck that. We're talking like an honest to goodness like a lot of these things don't connect in a conscious, uh, a logical way. But what the filmmaker, Kyle Edward Ball is his name. Um, what he has done that's really interesting is that he's sort of gone under the hood of what scares us. And the premise of the movie, if you don't know, is there's uh, two kids 
and they're in a house um, and and the parents have, may have gone out for the evening. There is some indication that maybe there's some strife with the parents even. Um, but again, this is all really roundabout. It's it, it, There is no definitive answer to a lot of this, uh, but there may be something wrong with the mother. Um, at any rate, they step out for the evening, uh, apparently, and the kids are left alone. And then all of a sudden, windows and doors stop appearing. And they are trapped within their house, but also are they alone in the house? And that is where the horror kind of comes from is you don't know exactly what's going on. You know that these children are being terrorized by something, maybe the mother, maybe it's something else pretending to be the mother. Uh, And it's hard to hear dialogue. And a lot of times the dialogue is even subtitled. Um, to let you know, like, hey, this is not a hundred percent on the up and up. Like, there's there's something uh, about the audio that's that's filtered and muddy, and I, uh, you know, I think a lot of this is referred to as like analog filmmaking, where you're using, um, if not old equipment, you're using filters to make the film look old and the audio sound like it was recorded on something that is not you know, a modern instrument to record audio. Uh, like, it, you know, the microphone I have is not terribly expensive, but it does pretty good sound. And even if I were across the room, you would still be able to hear, you know, very clearly what I was I was saying. And in Skin and Marink, all of that stuff is very muffled. And the way that I have heard people pitch this movie is like, oh, no, 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 you really need to watch this almost on a laptop, but definitely with headphones so you can kind of immerse yourself in it. And I totally agree. I think probably for my uh, 31 days of Halloween this year, my plan is to kind of do that, uh, to to give this another watch in the purest possible way uh, where I can really dig into it. So, uh, yeah, so aside from the, you know, the filmmaking itself, which I think is very good, um, and the story is definitely aimed at the subconscious, not the conscious level. And that is a stumbling block for some people. I don't think it makes you a better or worse viewer if you are not into art house movies. I just think it, it, I think it makes you a different viewer um, than myself because I do enjoy that kind of stuff. I, I blame Duncan McLeish for leading me down that dark path. Uh, but... Uh, so, it, you know, at the end of the day, Skinnamarink was one of those things where, like, there was one scene in particular that I thought was genuinely terrifying. And it gets creepier as it goes on. And then it hits a moment where you get into almost a Mad God-esque sort of alternate reality where you're like, I'm not even sure I understand what is happening anymore. But, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, this is more about the uh you know subconscious surreal uh version of of horror filmmaking and that's tough like that is a tough target to hit and i think skin and marine lands it more often than not uh which is very much to its credit so um as always this is absolutely a movie that if you want to drop by the discord and you know let me know what did you think of skin and marine i would love to hear it This is uh, definitely one for discussion. And a lot of people, uh, you know, I I think it's divisive uh, in the way that movies like this are, where a lot of people are like, I just, I could not get into this. This was, it was too long. I couldn't get my fingers in. Like there was nothing to hold on to. Uh, And I totally get that. Um, But, you know, if you're like me, there are going to be moments where you're like, that was genuinely terrifying like could i sit down and write the plot of skin and marine i think maybe i can get close but i don't know that i could tell you with certainty every beat of the of the story especially when you get to the end and things get especially surreal and weird uh that i don't i don't know that i can tell you uh with a you know a greater degree of accuracy what the end of the movie ultimately means um, I, I think I do, but you know, it, again, like all good art, I suppose, uh, it, it is about your interpretation, 
but I had a good time with it. Um, or at least, if not a good time, I had a really interesting time with it, and I, I was glad to have seen it. Uh, and, and so I would recommend Skin of Marink. If you haven't seen it, again, drop by the Discord, uh, which you can find the link to the Discord server on any of the, um, the posts from the Dark Parade on uh, legionpodcast.com. So uh, please drop by there. Let me know what you think. Um, so yeah, I, Skin of Marink, really good, I thought. Uh, not the scariest movie of the year. But then again, I don't know what that is. So maybe? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> and then our, for our, our centerpiece, uh, I'm, we're going to veer away from horror. And, and by centerpiece, I just mean it's the one in the middle. Um, I don't know how long we'll actually talk about this. I just wanted to discuss it because it had come up again on the Discord forum. Um, but uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, is the latest in the Marvel... Uh, series of films, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if you will. And I have felt like this phase of Marvel has been a real mess. And I'm not the only one. Like, I still enjoy the movies uh, for what they are. I just don't feel the connective tissue like, like you did in that, you know, first couple of phases leading up to, you know, Avengers, Endgame, and Infinity War. And just maybe it is wrong for us to assume that we are ever going to reach those heights again, because that was pretty incredible filmmaking. You know, you've been building uh, to that for many, many movies, but you hadn't overplayed your hand and you're dealing with the iconic characters. You got your your Captain's America, your Thors and your Spider-Man and, and that kind of thing. The, the one uh, bright spot in the recent cinematic universe, I feel, has been the Spider-Man No Way Home, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, I thought Multiverse of Badness, the latest Doctor Strange movie, was fine. Uh, I thought it was really fun. Um, I don't feel like it was, you know, one of those pieces, like it's a jigsaw puzzle piece that falls into this larger picture. Um, Although definitely the MCU has been, you know, by drips and drabs, been bringing the multiverse uh, stuff uh, to the fore both with the the Loki series and um, also, you know, Multiverse of Madness and No Way Home and now Quantumania. Um, You know, that is definitely the big battlefield on which we are going to set the the next, you know, big series of movies. But, you know, in the midst of that, you also had, like, The Eternals, which was a real flop. You know, not only did it just not do the kind of numbers that a movie like that you uh, you feel like ought to have done for it being this big, grand, sweeping thing from... Uh, it was a Chloe Zhang who did that, and, um, you know, a fantastic director, and it had a, a really solid cast, and it just kind of fizzled. It just wasn't that much fun it was a really dull movie at the end of the day and also just did not I couldn't now that I'm thinking about it I'm like I kind of remember who the villain was in that but it was just not anything exceptional Um, which is the one thing Quantumania I think has going for it but we'll get to that in a minute Uh, so yeah I you know I like the MCU stuff I like even the Disney Plus stuff uh, mostly I had a good time with Hawkeye I really liked She-Hulk I thought She-Hulk was You know, not quite that Deadpool, you know, being so self-referential that it it became sort of a parody of superhero movies, which Deadpool kind of is in some ways. Um, I just thought it was really fun. You know, it was very silly. It was it was much lighter. Uh, You know, Tatiana Maslany is a wonderful actor and she's great on that show. So I enjoy that even when you get to the end and you meet the, you know, uh, Kevin Feige. Uh, spoilers, but Kevin Feige kind of shows up in, in that show. So I liked all of that stuff. And, uh, but, you know, Wakanda Forever, again, I thought was kind of fine. I enjoyed the front end of that movie probably way more than the back end, like getting to know Namor and, and that sort of stuff I thought was really good. And then by the end of the movie, I was, again, just kind of shrugging and... Which is a shame because I really like Black Panther, 
And I don't think that the passing of Chadwick Boseman is, a, you know, a death blow to that series. I think you can do Black Panther. Um, and, and they certainly took a big swing at it. And I think it was kind of fine. But that's how I felt about most of these movies. Is like, that was fine. That was totally fine. Uh, it, it didn't knock my socks off. It's not building to something that I really like. It's just you know, an entertaining, breezy way to spend a couple hours. Um, and w which I guess will bring us up to quantum mania where once more, we are playing with the multiverse and, uh, in particular, in this case, the quantum realm where Ant-Man and the wasp and Hank Pym and Michelle Pfeiffer, who's, uh, Karen, Kate, something like that. Um, she ends up going to the quantum realm also, uh, along with Cassie, Ant-Man's daughter. They're all kind of sucked in. This is early, early going, so I'm not giving anything away. They get sucked into the quantum realm, uh, which they discover is being terrorized by a, a figure from Michelle Pfeiffer's past, a character known, known as King the Conqueror, who, if you watch the Loki series, you will remember uh, as, as sort of strangely one of the big bads of that series um and king is played by jonathan majors who i first uh saw in lovecraft country and he's amazing on lovecraft country and surprise surprise he is also amazing in quantum mania as king the conqueror um there is going to be a uh, another jonathan majors movie this summer with creed 3 that I really want to see uh, just for Jonathan Majors and, and Michael, uh, is it Michael B. Jordan? Speaking of, you know, Black Panther, Killmonger himself, Michael B. Jordan, um, who is also directing the movie, which is exciting because Michael B. Jordan has already proven, like, hey, he can act the hell out of a, a movie. Uh, if he can direct as well, then he, you know, the sky is the limit for that guy. Uh, he, he's going to be an amazing force in Hollywood for a very long time. Um, so yeah, Jonathan Majors having a, a big year uh, with this and Creed 3. I hope they both do well for him. Uh, this is another one of those like, hey, on Discord, we were talking about Quantumania and a couple of people saw it and were like, you know, real lukewarm about it. I'm probably a little higher on the movie and maybe it's just because I, you know, I saw it with Maya and the kids. The kids really had a good time with it. I, I'm enough of a nerd that I was like, oh, look, there's, you know, the, here's another character from the MCU uh, or appearing for the first time in the MCU that I, I wasn't sure what they were going to do with. And I kind of liked how they handled it. Uh, not just King, but, you know, sort of a surprise secondary villain uh, that I will leave to you to discover. Um, and I thought that was fun. I, I thought it was uh, visually really interesting. Um, there, you know, the, there is the equivalent of the Star Wars cantina scenes a couple of times during the course of that movie, which I really liked. Uh, it, was, it was colorful. It was creative. It was pretty funny. And, you know, it, I like the fact that it was... There is a, hey, we got to save the world quality to it. But it's more like, hey, we got to save this realm that we don't really know that's, you know, different from our reality. Um, although it, the big threat, of course, is that, hey, like, Kang wants to escape the quantum realm so he can go on and devastate uh, other worlds and other timelines. And Kang is just an interesting villain. Like, the best parts of the movie are the parts where he's on screen. You know, I think Paul Rudd is, is really fun as well. But it's Jonathan Majors who makes Quantumania worth watching. Um, and his villainy is pretty fantastic. And seeing him, you know, uh, play this, you know, sort of thoughtful but dark character. Uh, and, and I think all the best villains are that way, right? Like villains that even if you don't empathize with them, if you don't fully understand their motivations, they can explain themselves in a way that makes you understand their villainy, if not fully, uh, you know, uh, like recognize it as something within yourself, you know, not maybe not true empathy, but, but certainly 
um, a sense that like, oh, okay, I get it. I understand why he's doing this. Um, in the course of the movie, I think, you know, some of the secondary characters get lost. Bill Murray pops in for a minute and he's actually pretty good. Like he's got a little bit of a, you know, he's, he's still Bill Murray, but there's a, a dramatic bent to his performance that reminds me of, you know, things like Razor's Edge and, you know, when Bill Murray was trying to be an honest to goodness actor and not just a comic actor, there is that comic kind of thing, but there's a sort of a melancholy to his character in the movie that I really like. Um, that reminds me more of something like Bottle Rocket than Caddyshack. Uh, so I thought that was really good. Um, and, you know, it, like the big conclusion, the big battle at the end of the movie, I generally get pretty tired of those with Ant-Man. I was at least engaged with it. I was, you know, I was rooting for the main characters. And when they were doing like, you know, super heroic stuff. I was like, that was pretty cool. And the villains doing mean stuff and that's great. And here comes this other thing. And you know, all of that stuff I was really into. So I was kind of with the movie all the way. And, uh, you know, do I think it's one of the best Marvel movies? No, but I haven't felt that way about any of the Ant-Man movies. I think a lot of people really like Ant-Man and the Wasp. I was really cool on that one. I didn't really care for that. I think that this is a better movie than that one. Um, with uh, Ghost, I guess was the the villain in that movie, and I I just never really uh, got into that storyline. This one I thought was more fun. And again, I think a lot of that is just Jonathan Jonathan Majors being amazing uh, as Kang. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with Kang moving forward because the nature of his character is that he exists across multiple timelines and because we're dealing with multiverse stuff in the MCU all over the place I mean that is what we are putting front and center right now uh, then Kang is almost assuredly going to be sort of the new Thanos um, he is going to be the character that um, is plaguing all of our heroes in the MCU in the foreseeable future so I, I assume that's going to be continued with the Marvels to some degree. And I forget what's after that. Whatever it is, I'll probably go see it with the kids in the theater and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so Quantumania, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, more properly Quantumania, I thought was good. I thought it was fun. Uh, you know, do I think it's going to change my life? Of course not. Um, but, you know, what movie? what movie does really? Um, which brings us to the final movie we are going to be talking about this evening, ladies and jelly spoons. And that is the movie I am fresh off of watching, uh, which is the movie Cocaine Bear. Now, if you know me, as some of you do, you have to know that uh, there is nothing I like more than a movie in which uh, there is a giant animal what eats people. You add to that... Um, a, a scenario in which said giant animal eating people is on cocaine <laughs> as, as, as is the story of this movie and you've, you've sold a ticket like I, I want to see Cocaine Bear and uh, so Cocaine Bear is uh, directed by um, Elizabeth Banks uh, who has uh, directed some other stuff already and um, she is a very competent director um, the uh, it stars Carrie Russell and O'Shea Jackson Jr., who is the son of Ice Cube. Uh, and in this movie, as much as in like Straight Out of Compton, I can't tell you how many times I was like, "Oh my God, he looks so much like uh, Ice Cube." It's it's crazy. And then um, Alden Ehrenreich uh, is the the other you know, sort of main player in the movie, uh, playing Eddie. And, um, and I thought he was really good in it too. Uh, he is probably best known for playing Han Solo in, uh, that movie Solo, which did not do so well. I don't think that's his fault. Um, but I thought he was great in, in Cocaine Bear. I thought he was a lot of fun. And all right. So the premise of the movie, if you don't know, basically it is that, you know, hey, in 1985, 
this plane carrying cocaine uh, is going down um, as per you know the the rules the standing rule uh, from this cartel hey if the plane is, is gonna suffer this problem then we need to throw the drugs out into this specific area and then we'll go hunting for them and we'll go we'll go find them you know put them in these big red duffel bags and uh, so that's what happens only the guy jumping out of the plane um, has a, a misstep and does not survive to go looking for the cocaine and instead the cocaine is found by a bear and the movie opens with cocaine bear doing what cocaine bear do and there is a liberal amount of murder in this movie as cocaine bear does its thing there's also a story like carrie russell as a mother and her uh one of her kids or her kid and one of her uh kid's friends are in threatened by the cocaine bear and she has to go search for them meanwhile ray liotta the sadly past ray liotta uh and some of his gang are also hunting for the cocaine and then there's a cop that is also on on the trail and there are some punks that are hanging out in this state park to steal purses and just do punk stuff just doing punk shit right and so anyway they get uh, uh, in the mix as well and it, you, so the, the characters are pretty fun um, Eddie who is the, the son, Ray Liotta's son who has gotten out of the family business and his wife has died and Ray Liotta is taking care of uh his kid like Ray Liotta's grandson is, is with Ray Liotta and the guy just can't get his shit together after the death of his wife. And he's taken on this trip to kind of, it's partly so Ray, Ray Liotta can get him to kind of get back in the swing of things and get back into the family business of drug dealing. Um, but he's just not in a, an emotional place for it. And it on a, like if you were going to write an essay about cocaine bear, you could do a legitimate, examination of this movie as a story about different kinds of parenting and what happens in adverse situations when you're in a family situation that is not normal that has been upset by something and how you make that work whether it is Carrie Russell whether it is Ray Liotta whether it is Eddie um, the, the the same thing is true of uh, the the main cop in the movie who is dealing with uh, like a new dog in his life and he's not really sure if he likes the dog and cocaine bear herself um, and uh, you know I'll leave it to you to find that parental story in, in the film but you know so there, there's like an actual emotional hook there there is stuff happening it knows what it is like a movie called cocaine bear knows what the tone of the movie should be which is kind of silly kind of funny but also don't screw around and skimp on cocaine bear doing what cocaine bear do and and it gets all of that stuff right and i don't think the movie is fantastic but it's incredibly entertaining it's very funny it's very fun the moments uh where you see cocaine bear being lured away from <laughs> a rampage by someone who has figured out like, Oh, if we just pour cocaine out, then cocaine bear will get sidetracked by that because cocaine bear loves cocaine more than cocaine bear loves killing. Uh, that stuff I thought was very funny. There are some really good moments in it. The, the thing that maybe hamstrings the movie a little bit is the CGI is mostly really good when it comes to cocaine bear. Cause cocaine bear is the only thing that's not, a physical thing in the, in the shot. And so, um, you know, I think work was done and Elizabeth Banks should probably be lauded for n kind of having a vision for that and making sure that like cocaine bear looks good for the most part. There are moments where you're like, ah, I don't, maybe cocaine bear looks a little cartoony here, a little rubbery. Uh, but for the most part, cocaine bear looks good. And, and that is important in a movie called cocaine bear. Uh, and it's gory. Like the, I, I've, I'm sure at some point there'll be an unrated version, but there's some viscera in this where I was like, oh, well, we are doing looping intestines. Got it. Great. And a lot of evisceration, a lot of, a lot of 
limbs going flying. Um, there is one sequence involving a uh, cocaine bear at a ranger station that culminates in the uh, uh, an ambulance showing up and the eventual fate of that ambulance. And that whole sequence was just deliriously fun. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, like, on one level, it's like, I wish the whole movie had been this, but you can't do that, right? Like, you got to have the emotional stuff to kind of pull you through. And, but that part of it, it was great. It was so much fun. I was so pleased with how silly and fun and bloody and, um, like, Cocaine Bear is never going to be an Oscar nominated movie. I can't tell you how happy I am that it exists and that this very, like, fun, silly, not quite grindhouse. It's a little too classy to be a real grindhouse, like, grisly kind of movie. And I don't mean grisly as in gory. I mean the movie Grizzly. It's it's classier than that. It's a little more high-minded than Grizzly, but it still understands that it needs to have Cocaine Bear going cocaine crazy. And, and it does. It does. And there is something I find hysterical uh, within the, the course of that movie about the Cocaine Bear just becoming completely sidetracked and, like, I've just got to get more cocaine. I know that there are people around that I could be mauling, but my my goal here is not mauling people. My goal here is doing cocaine. And sometimes when I do too much cocaine, I'm going to end up mauling people. But because there are a number of bags dropped throughout this forest, uh, you know, Cocaine Bear is at no shortage of cocaine. And, and so that's very, very funny. Um, there is a point uh, where Cocaine Bear is is a little bit battered, and the cocaine is much like Popeye spinach. In fact, I would be shocked if at no point did, in the making of this movie did no one make that comparison because it is a straight up Cocaine Bear's on the ropes. What can <laughs> what can get Cocaine Bear back on her feet? Why cocaine, of course. Uh, so it was, it was truly wonderful. The, the last few shots are very funny. It's got a little credit stinger that is kind of fine, but the last shot where, uh, some new hikers come across, uh, some bears and you're like, well, maybe this story isn't totally over, but it, it's really wonderful. Uh, yeah. So cocaine bear is really fun. I, I you know, again, th- this is not high art. But it's a good time. It was it was a solid ninety minutes of, you know, silliness and gore and, you know, I had this really fun moment where me and another guy, um, were showing up at the at the movies at about the same time, and, uh, like he was right in front of me, and he got his ticket for Cocaine Bear. I got mine. Like both of us are headed to the same theater. We kind of did the acknowledgement of like, Oh, we're both weirdos who are going to see cocaine bear alone at 1130 on a Sunday morning. (laughs) What kind of people are we? And then on the way out, he, he's kind of laughing and he says, so what did you think? And it's that kind of movie where you're like, you know what? I I get like someone could watch that movie and, and say that it's too over the top, but my goodness. I mean, it, I thought it was uh, a real good time. And that's what I told him, and he agreed. So, me and a stranger bonded over Cocaine Bear. And, you know, when movies bring us together like that, what what, what can be better than that? Okay, so that's enough. Uh, so, thumbs up all around. Skin of uh artsy-fartsy. But if you enjoy that kind of thing, I think you'll like Skin of Marink, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Uh, lesser Marvel to be sure, but if you got kids, eh, take them. It's a good time. Uh, we saw it in 3D and all that stuff, and that was real fun. And then uh, Cocaine Bear, not a movie for the kids, but if you are like me and enjoy animals munching on people, uh, try sprinkling a little cocaine on that mixture, and I think you'll have a blast. Of all th- three of those movies, for me, Cocaine Bear is the big winner because I've been sort of low-key excited about seeing this movie for a while, and I, I think it... I think it delivered exactly what it promised and, and a little bit more. I think it was it, genuinely very funny at times, uh, had a really good spirit. And it, uh, it was written by the same guy who 
wrote the babysitter if that tells you anything it's it's got not a dissimilar tone uh than that so uh yeah uh if you enjoy those movies uh or don't drop me a line over on the discord uh server for the legion podcast i will be curious to see what uh you knuckleheads think and uh and that'll do it i think next up for dark parade is a heart of horror episode if i look at my calendar correctly uh, that does seem to be the case. So, uh, with it being March, um, we will be doing something, uh, I hope related to March madness. Uh, and I've got kind of an idea for what we should do. So we will, uh, we, we will be back, uh, then with Kate Pollock for that. So, uh, anyway, thanks for hanging with me while I'm getting all the school stuff together. Uh, now that I'm done with the education part, now I'm doing the job part and I'm slowly but surely, uh, getting my feet under me and uh, I, I can't wait uh, to start to feel like I can just come home in the evenings and, and be mostly done. So uh, thanks for all of that and thank you as always for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.